year old male patient complain of abdominal pain lump in epigastric region which is increasing in size nausea backache usg abdomen revealed a large well defined cystic lesion in epigastrium ct scan abdomen showed a large well defined thin wall peripherally enhancing hypodense collection in a lesser sac measuring 14.6 by 9.3 by 12 cm volume 840 cc in the epigastrium causing compression of the left lobe of liver and pancreas posteriorly suggestive of a large pancreatic pseudocyst in the lesser sac so now shifting to dr kenneth bin moller all right um while well, they're trying to get my mic in place so i just want to uh, emphasize a few teaching points i introduce the echo endoscope this is the therapeutic echo endoscope into the duodenal bowl first and you can see on the eus image this large pseudocyst but you'll note at the top when we when we put the doppler on you see that there are a lot of vessels here interposed you see that so if you were to try to puncture this cyst under endoscopic guidance without eus it could be disastrous you can see these large vessels interposed this is from the duodenum Let's go back now into the Just stomach. Just shows the other other side where you actually going to put a needle. That side seems to be reasonably clear. Just can we have the Doppler on this side where you have your yes. on the yep. other side? So now now we we're, we're in the stomach. stomach now. We're in another site. All right. And so when we evaluate this cyst, we can see it has a mature wall. That's very important. We can see that the cyst contents look homogeneous, and it looks virtually anechoic. There's there's really no necroses here. So this is important in terms of the type of drainage that we want to perform. We don't anticipate needing to do necrosectomy at all or debridement. So we can use a smaller stent. In this case, if we do use a LAMS, it could be a 10 millimeter. It doesn't have to be a 15 millimeter. Um, and we're looking at the wall, the interposed wall between the stomach and uh, the cyst. You can see the muscular propria of the stomach wall, and you can see the cyst wall. There is a small layer, echogenic layer. sandwiched in between sandeep if you just magnified even more what this tells you is that there's probably not um ideal adherence between the cyst wall and the stomach wall if there's ideal adherence you would not see that echogenic layer that echogenic layer is fat but it doesn't matter because we're using a lumen opposing metal stent to drain this and it's going to hold the cyst wall in contact with the stomach wall All right. So these uh, are the so things you we evaluate. Ken, if I got you right, would you say that it would be inappropriate to use a plastic stent I in think this patient? It may be inappropriate because if you if you look at this again, you see that echogenic layer between the two walls. That's fat. That means there is not ideal adherence. So you may be okay, but if you dilate too aggressively when you place your plastic stent, that is to say the stent does not snugly uh, seal off the fistula attract that tract that you created then you could get leak between the cyst wall and the stomach wall and then you must be very careful not to push the cyst wall away from the stomach wall so these are the common mistakes that are made when we perform pseudocyst drainage that if we use the seldinger technique where we're exchanging over the wire for different instruments as we exchange for these instruments we may push the cyst away including when we place our stent you can actually push the cyst away as you're pushing your stent in so let's have the uh, sheet now i think now. that's a great learning point so we're going to uh can you focus focus on the head. just show, focus show on this here i mean inserting this through the working channel this is a therapeutic channel 3.7 this is hydrophilic coated and so what we can actually do is just get put some water on here water it helps water. advance it more water smoothly down the working channel Some oil. You don't need to. It's hydrophilic, so actually, water is ideally what you want. Well, we don't. We don't have to do that. So, so what? What are you uh, using now, Ken? So this is the. Nineteen. This is the lumen opposing metal stent that I. Oh, just de developed. This okay. Is the Axio stent. So it's called Axios. Axioostomy. Coaxioostomy stent. So abbreviated Axios. And so it lure locks just like an FNA needle to the uh, to the working channel like this. So I push it down, and I'm just going to. turn it's a swivel lure lock which means i can rotate here oh that's so nice so has the x lumina name <laughs> so that's <laughs> nice it was acquired by boston so um you can see then here uh on the front you can change the orientation towards the operator so you'll see there's a lock and unlock button here and we unlock it to advance this black hub this advances the sheath forward 
So that's just like an F and A needle advancing the needle forward. So we advance the sheath forward here, and then this gray hub is what releases the stent. And we release the distal flange and the proximal flange completely independent of one another, and there's a full stop between. So as we pull this gray hub back, it'll click when the distal flange is deployed. And only then do we uh, pull the gray hub all the way back to deploy the proximal flange. And you'll see that in just a moment. All right, so now you also notice I'm wearing no lead. We're going to do this all without fluoroscopy. <laughs> We're going to do this all under EUS guidance the entire time. We're never going to take our eye off of the ultrasound image. That's very important because our access is quite tangential. <coughs> so if you accidentally switch to the endoscopic view, obviously that orientation will be different and you can get a shift of your plane. All right, step number one, unlock. All right, now I'm going to advance the, sh the sheath forward and I'm going to, not cautery, not yet. So we put the cautery only when we're ready to use cautery. At the very top, I want to just uh, magnify, yeah, show it, thank, thank uh, you, Sandeep. So you can, can we get a very PIP top. of the U.S. image? Oh, yeah, PIP please. of the U.S. image? Put the U.S. The image yeah. on. Okay. Endoscopy, uh, U.S. image big, external image small. Room small. Yeah, that's Beautiful. right. Beautiful. Now you can see where the arrow is, and I'll just push this forward a little bit. See how it's tenting against the wall there? So that is the tip of this 11 French cotter, uh, of this 11 French catheter. It's bougie shaped, so it's tapered towards the tip. It does accommodate a guide wire if you wanted to advance it over the guide wire, but there's no need to use a guide wire in this case. It has a micro wire that runs along the tip and then along the side. And the idea is to create a cutting effect using auto cut to enter as effortlessly into the cyst lumen as possible. So now we're ready to hook the cautery up. So now our assistant will hook up the cautery, all right? And now I'm going to step on the yellow pedal, which is the to, do, to deploy or execute pure cutting current, and I'm going to enter into the cyst. Now I'm inside, and I'm advanced the catheter, and I'll try to capture that plane for you. There it is, a little bit better. I'm going to lock here. I've locked. I'm going to take off the safety pin, the yellow safety pin like this. Okay, now it's off. I'm going to unlock the gray hub here, and I'm just going to pull back on the gray hub till it clicks, and you're going to see the distal flange deploy. And when it clicks, the distal flange is fully deployed, and I don't need to do anything. I can sit here and talk, take a phone call if I need to quickly. I can wait if I want, and when I'm ready, I'm going to unlock now here on the sheath, and I'm going to pull the sheath back like this. All right, I'm going to snug it up against the wall till it starts to deform just a little bit, then I'm going to relock again. Now I'm ready to deploy the proximal flange in the working channel of the echo endoscope. And all I'm going to do now is pull back on this gray hub like this. Endoscopy, you mean? No. Yeah, you don't need no, no endoscopy. I'm just no. going to pull back, and as I'm pulling back, it's deploying the proximal flange in the working channel. Now I'm ready to switch to the endoscopic view. Now let's go to the endoscopic view full screen. I'm going to unlock the hub. I'm going to start to give some air. And as I give the air, I'm going to I'm going to pull away, give some air, and start pushing out the stent. And there it is, and it's deployed. Wow. Okay. So and that's so smooth. And the fluid is gushing out, right? It's decompressed. It's flowing vigorously. And because in this case, this patient is not intubated, I'm going to immediately start to suction. I'm going to pull out, pull out the, the stent so I have more room in the Which working channel for suction. Cap Let's put the cap back on now. Cap, cap. And immediately yes. I'm going to start suctioning. So you can see the lumen, and me because of the large diameter, the lumen has immediately filled up. I'm going to take off the valve to uh, Su get better. better suction, right? And so now I'm just having my finger on the suction valve, and I'm just sucking this fluid. And I already instructed the assistant um, to have suction ready. You can see suction is ready just in case so that we minimize any risk of aspiration. Now, we intubate our patients for this to avoid aspiration, but you don't have to as long as you take the right precautions. So you can see right now I'm not giving any gas. I'm just sucking the fluid out. As soon as I get a modicum amount of this fluid out, a reasonable amount, then I can start uh, replacing uh, start insufflating a gas to get a view uh, of the lumen opposing metal stent. So that was very well controlled, single operator, you don't need anyone else around no. you. No. 
No, it's all done by one operator. That's the whole idea because there's no room for error when you're deploying a stent of such short length of just one centimeter. So really, the concept of the lumen opposing stent is, is, to be honest, not that revolutionary. That's not really what I'm so proud of. What I'm proud of is the delivery system because <laughs> I had to think really carefully through the delivery system. How do you make it literally idiot proof? so that you can't do anything <laughs> wrong. And there are actually numbers on the handle that I put one, two, three, four, so that if you forget, you can just look at the numbers and know what's the next step Sequence. to do. Can you know, remember, so remember people the in the audience don't realize that this is your brainchild and you've uh, yeah, I worked sort on of devised the exhaust For 10 years, <laughs> yeah. 10 years of my life was dedicated to developing this. And that is a superb it demonstration. It was inspired by those thousands of hours spent draining pseudocysts and having one complication after the other. So I was determined to find a way to make pseudocyst drainage simpler um, and easier and safer above all. So now I'm putting the, uh, the air in. Air I think inside. we can safely put the air in and so that you can get sort of a final view of yeah. the uh, stent in place. Ken, that uh, was masterly. Ken, Ken, this has been commercially available in the United States? Well, yes. It's and it's what's the pricing there in the United here. States? So there you, you see, see it. Wow. Okay. That looks beautiful. So eh? the, the cyst it will be actually practically empty now. We can look at it with the U.S. as well. But you can see now. And of course, if you wanted to, you have the option of going inside of the cyst with your uh, endoscope. You'd have to dilate the lumen. There's no need to do that in this case, right? You can almost see, look, I'm suctioning, and you see the fluid just gushing out here, right? So you're kind of looking right almost looking through the still compressed lumen of the uh, metal stent, self-expanding. So basically, in two to three days, this will have fully opened up to its full diameter. In this case, it's 10 millimeters. Usually, I'm using almost always a 15, because I rarely see a pseudocyst like this that's, comp that's only fluid. Usually, the cysts that come to me have necroses in them, and so I need to do debridement, or I need to go in and irrigate and clean it out. Don't I always wait a week before I do the actual manual debridement, but I always go into the cyst and I clean it out. I do what I call vigorous irrigation, and I use hydrogen peroxide for that. So two questions, uh, Ken, yes. is when would you remove this um, exure stent? And two, uh, when do you start looking for a ductal disruption or a disconnected uh, duct syndrome? So the quick answer is, firstly, this will be gone in two weeks. So two weeks, the patient comes back, you don't get CT or any of that, because that's unnecessary radiation, right? We saved radiation for everyone in the room today, and we want to save the patient from radiation from CT scan. So in two weeks, the patient comes back. You do EUS, confirm the cyst is gone, or you can look in the stent, and you'll see that the stent, the back wall of the cyst has collapsed down and started to granulate. So then you can just remove the axios with the rat tooth bi uh, biceps, forceps, and pull it out, and you're done. Um, in cases where you have necroses and you need to do debridement, but then I bring them back weekly and I do the debridement and I will get CT scans in certain intervals to follow the course. Here you need to have CT to evaluate what's going on with the greater pancreas. What about Disco the disconnected duct? Disconnected duct. Disconnected duct is only, only if the patient has recurrence of the cyst after you've removed the, uh, the, the stent. Then the patient gets an ERCP to look for disconnected duct. So I think Ken, it's a brilliant performance. I think a big round of applause. Great Fantastic. job by Master. And Thanks, we move to you. the next room. Thank you. One